So Toyota usually designs their cars well. You know, you work on them, they're easy to work on. But every once in a while, we have a job that is, how should I say, for lack of a better word, a nightmare. Like this very innocent looking starter. So starters usually in Toyota land, if you have a four cylinder, is a 10 minute job. If you have a V6, it's a 15 minute job. But if you have a V8, it is not a 15 minute job, let alone sometimes could be a 15 hour job. So here is, here's what happens with the V8s. The old V8s, everybody complained about them because the starter was underneath the intake manifold. In my opinion, that is the best place for it in a V8. Super easy. You take the intake manifold off. Some people will take it out to be a big deal. It's actually not. You take the manifold off, take a few connectors off, two bolts, and the starter comes out nice and clean and safe and beautiful. Then we updated to the new V8, which Toyota listened. I wish they didn't, but they did. And they decided to move the starter to the side. And because of the way this V8 sits in these cars, it is such a horrible place. We are replacing a starter on this Lexus LX570 with the 3UR. It's a common problem. And the reason it is a common problem is because of its location, where that starter sits. It sits directly behind the exhaust manifold. So when you go to replace these and you open the, the repair manual, it very, again, innocently tells you Remove the exhaust manifold, pull the starter out, put the starter, put the exhaust manifold, and have a nice day. But that is so far from reality, and it's such a horrendous design, it is unbelievable. Let me show you, and you will get a better idea, and I'll share with you some tips if you're doing this. This is not a DIY job. This is actually not even a beginner technician job. This is a job, either way you go, is very, very difficult and very frustrating. You're working in a very small room, but it's doable either way. Let's raise the car up and let me show you what I mean. So here is the starter. You can barely see it through the opening. Right here is the starter. Really impossible to see. It's really buried in there. So here is the two problems you have. So the exhaust manifold wraps over the starter. That's not a problem. You can always sneak it from underneath it. But the problem is they put heat shields, one on top of the starter, one on top of the exhaust manifold. The one on top of the exhaust manifold, three bolts, relatively easy to access, and you get it out. But the one on top of the starter, the exhaust manifold overlaps it, which what makes this job extremely difficult. I mean, they really could have designed this better. If that heat shield on top of the starter comes off easier or they thought about it, okay, let's design it in a way where it's easier to pull it out. This would have been not a bad job. So why am I not removing the exhaust manifold on this? You know, this is, let's follow the book, right? Well, here's what the book doesn't account for. Rust. See, here's what's going to happen when I go and try to remove the bolts for the exhaust manifold. One of three things. The first one is, which is the best case scenario, which is not likely. They're going to just come out easily. Life is good. Studs are fine. Everything is good. The second case scenario, which is the more likely one, some of the studs will pull out, potentially damaging the thread in the head. And the secondary air pipe, which is the one right here, right on the side, you have a secondary air injection pipe. One or both of these studs will break. Notorious, no matter what you do to them, they just snap right off. That is the uh, second best case scenario. Worst case scenario, some of these studs break in the cylinder head or the nuts round off. Well, that's not a problem. You know, you can extract them. But would you like to join me to show you where these studs are? See, some of them are right here. They're very easily accessible, but when we get to the ones behind the strut tower, that's where the real problems start. That's when you basically have this much room to work with, and if you have something broken or rounded off, that's it. You're there for a day or two trying to get them out. So you basically, when you start a job like this, you have to choose which direction do you want to go. Do you want to go the long, dangerous route, 
which eventually, if it goes well, things will be easy because once you remove this exhaust manifold, the starter just comes out, goes back in, all the shields go in, life is beautiful. Or are you going to go the safer route where you're disturbing as little as possible, but you are going to be disturbing your hands, your mind, your patience, everything. Because when you do not remove the exhaust manifold, this becomes an absolute nightmare. Let me raise the car up once more and I'll show you in case you're doing this, what actually needs to happen for this starter to come out without removing the exhaust manifold. So the first thing you have to do is of course, remove the exhaust. That's simple. Three bolts and three nuts in the front, two bolts in the back comes off. The second thing that needs to happen is you need to get this coolant pipe out of the way. Now we don't want to drain the coolant here and cost our customer a lot. So I clamp the hoses. This is for the transmission heat exchanger. You're going to loosen this, move it to the side a little bit. And then you're going to get your dipstick out, or at least loose. We have it loose here. If you come right here, Eros, you can show them. Dipstick is right here. It's loose. It's out of the opera oil pan. And then this transmission lines, you have to get them loose so you can push them down a little bit. And then you'll be able to access the easy bolt of the starter. This one right here, super easy. Not a hard bolt. That bolt at the top, though, is the hard one. I mean, that bolt is near impossible to get to. You have very little room. You have to improvise with tools. And once you get it loose, it'll come out easily. Usually those don't break or seize or whatnot. Although I have seen a Tundra break before, but that was extremely rusty. Once you have that, you're going to move the starter forward. And you actually have on the Lexus ones, you have a oil level sensor right here. You need to disconnect it because otherwise you're going to crush it. Actually, I'm going to plug it back in now. Then you're going to move the starter back and bring it here. You want the nose of the starter to come in this area right here by the exhaust manifold, and then you'll be able to move it. You have to push this down and very gently move it out. There is actually enough room to get it out because that is the new starter in there already. So this is, for lack of a better word, bad engineering at its finest. I mean, first, the biggest problem you're going to have with this is the exhaust shields. And let me show you the old starter why this is such a problem. The exhaust shield sits on three bolts right here. And it also wraps very little over the starter. So you have to get these two bolts. Those are very easily accessible. Very easy to get these two. This one, however, the exhaust manifold is right here. Literally right here. So you have this much room to wrench it out, get it out, and let me get that shield so you can actually see it. Here is our friendly shield. You see the three bolts, three holes, they correspond here. This is the one that is a problem, and this curve is a problem. And you actually have to push this curve up, kind of deform this, and once you install it back, put, tighten the bottom bolt, and then push the top to bring it into the starter so you can tighten the third bolt. The third bolt is extremely difficult to get back on, and this will probably take as long as the whole job. The other shield that sits on the exhaust manifold is not bad to install once you have the pipe out. This is it. But the worst part is they have this flimsy shield that once you pull it out, if you mangle it, now the holes won't line up, and now you're there fighting, bending it back and bend. I mean, this is such a horrendous design. They could have really done better here. And you will notice the labor times on this job will vary significantly. They could be as low as two hours for the unsuspecting independent shop that has never done one of these, looked up the labor time. Oh yeah, two hours, that should be enough. It's just a, it's just a starter. And they will spend the next two hours trying to find where the starter even is. Or you'll go to a shop that has been burned by this job and they'll quote you eight hours. And I don't blame them because 
if one of these bolts break for the exhaust manifold, if they're going that route, they're going to be there for a lot more than eight hours. And if they go this route, which we just did here, it's still not a simple job. You're going to be here for a few hours of agony, of fighting, of very carefully working everything out so nothing will break and everything goes back the way it's supposed to be. This is flat out horrendous design. I mean, I would so much rather they would have kept the starter safe and sound underneath the intake, regardless of what people say, then put it in this horrendous spot and put these flimsy shields over it. This is flat out a bad idea. And folks, the owner of this car actually is doing this preventatively and against my advice, I have to say the truth. These starters, they usually last a pretty long time. On the, this is, by the way, the same design on the LX, on the Land Cruiser, on the Tundra, on the Sequoia. Same thing with this engine and the 4.6. The GX is the same thing. I mean, they love to use this design now on the V8s. And this is possibly the worst job you will do on a V8, aggravation level-wise. Not length-wise. Yeah, cam towers could be longer, but they're not aggravating. This is just... It requires extreme patience and a lot of time on, on little bolts that you're, you're spending an hour just taking one bolt off. That's how bad this design is. And I wish somebody would come up with, it, with an idea where this shield is really the worst thing and the second worst thing is wrenching the top bolt out. This shield is where it starts. This is where the problems are and it only goes downhill from there. Folks, do not replace these preventatively. And for those of us in the Rust Belt, expect things to go south if you decide to go the exhaust manifold route. Because I've, I've had a customer on the phone. We haven't done that job yet. But they were like, no, I want my exhaust manifold removed because I want to replace the gasket. I'm like, you do know that you are opening Pandora's box there. Well, I don't know what we're going to find. You see, whether you're going to find good things or bad things. Just know, this is what we call in the automotive business, the repair business, can of worms. The less can of worms you open when you're working on cars, the better. Even if it means you're going to get aggravated and you're going to be spending one hour per bolt. That's how this works. Because in the end, you want to cost your customer the, the least amount of additional things that happen because... It's not my fault they designed this car like that. It's not my fault that it is rusty and the bolts are ready to snap off the exhaust manifold. But still, we try to fix these cars the best way possible, at the least additional stuff that has to happen possible. Folks, don't replace the starter pre just as a preventative maintenance because you're going to be spending a lot of money and it is not the job you want to tackle as a DIY. This is another one. Even on a lift, this is extremely difficult to do. I'm telling you, this is one of the worst designs, possibly the only other design that I see that is as bad as this or worse is when you go into a Lexus IS or a GS all-wheel drive where the axle goes through the oil pan and then the bearing seizes onto the oil pan and that's it. You basically, every time you need to do an axle, you have to replace the oil pan potentially. That is another bad design. And another one that is similar to that one is Highlanders and Siennas. People will be surprised about this. All-wheel drive Highlander and Sienna. See, they used to have a metal transfer case or a steel transfer or cast iron, whatever you want to call it. That was great. Axle came out of it. Beautiful. Then they decided to go with an all-aluminum transfer case. And it was bigger because it needed to be bigger because you can, you need the strength. So the bearing for the passenger side axle also goes into the transfer case and there is absolutely no way to get it out. Once salt hits it and a few years pass, it is basically welded together. Dissimilar metals, aluminum on the, on the housing, steel on the bearing, they weld themselves together. And guess what happens when you try to beat them and heat them and try to, you're going to crack the transfer case. Now you need a new transfer case. This is such a bad design. It's unbelievable. And this one too. Look, they make decent cars, but every once in a while, they have a bad apple there. This is one of them. This engine is a great engine. This car is a great car, but this is really bad design here. Folks, I hope this video is helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. I hope if you are tackling this job, hope I can buy you a cup of coffee because it is not fun. 
I've been battling this for a couple hours now, and we're going to keep going. Starter is in, but we still have many battles to battle. One of them is that shield and everything around it just to put this thing back together. So be patient, take pride in your work, and just know you're not doing something wrong when you're doing this, that it's not going well. It's just bad design, flat out. There's no other way to say it. Folks, if you like this video, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. Until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.